and can be sent to anybody who maybe hasn't been able to make it. Um, so hello, um, all new faces to me. I think I saw Catherine had joined here. Um, only person I know, otherwise I think it's all new introductions. So my fullest name is Ndibuzanyi Mpepu Wamasingo. Most people call me Ndi, so N-D-I, the first three um, letters of my name. And I think I would like to maybe just share a little bit about my name just as an introduction for you to get me to know me a little bit more. And then I'll definitely like to just do a round of everybody's names. Um, but sharing around my name, I think links quite well to the two uh, topics that I'll be covering with you this weekend and then next weekend. So it's maybe a good way to start. So my name, Dibuzani, growing up, I was really, really ashamed of my name. Um, to the point where I actually made up a whole new name and would tell people that my name is Samantha and that they could just call me Samantha. Um, and so there was a lot that went behind that. Firstly, I think people found my name quite long and complicated. Some people felt like they couldn't pronounce it. Um, and so I always felt some sense of shame around it or like it was inconvenient for people. Um, and then, of course, you know, as I've come to study and learn and grow, I think there was also a sense of cultural racism that came in with that, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about in our time together. But, um, you know, I guess the sense of whiteness um, and the English language maybe being seen as more superior, particularly in the context that I grew up in and African culture and African language and African names kind of being seen as inferior. Um, and I sort of internalized that for myself and felt like if I gave myself an English name or white name, that might be a little bit better. Um, so I think that definitely links to some of the things that we'll be talking about today and tomorrow when discussing diversity, equity and belonging and inclusion in the context of yoga. The other aspect um, or topic that I'll be sh uh, sharing with you around is um, African cosmology in the context of yoga. And that's next week. Um, and I think that links a lot to how I kind of grew into my name and feeling more conf confident and proud in my name and who I am. So in the African context, um, particularly in my own, which is of the Vavenda culture, names have a lot of significance, a lot of spiritual significance. Um, and when you're given a name, um, you your name is linked to sort of what your life purpose is going to be. And therefore your name is kind of a reminder to you to rise into that purpose. Um, and so when I found this out, I was quite curious about what my name meant um, and what the purpose imbued within my name was. Um, and so Ndibuzanyi directly translated means, who do I tell? Um, however, in the cultural context, when you say Ndibuzanyi in Chivenda, um, it's almost like you're expressing some sense of injustice or some sense of ill being in the community. And so when you give a child the name Ndibuzanyi, you are hoping that they can bring a sense of justice, a sense of well being, a sense of peace into the community. Um, and that's something that I've always been quite deeply connected to. Hence, I am in the social justice field, in the well being field, as well being a counselor. Um, and so that's something that really yeah, started to change my relationship with my name when I start to understand what it meant from an African context, African cosmology point of view. Um, and my name as well, when you say Ndibuzani, most people will respond and say Wudzani Vadzimu. So Ndibuzani is who do I tell? And when they say Wudzani Vadzimu, it means tell your ancestors, tell the divine. And so next week when we speak a little bit, um, you'll see that ancestry is an important aspect of African cosmology. And basically when you give a child this name, it's kind of just, yeah, to remind them to to remember this connection to their ancestors um, and to bring this kind of connection into the community as well. 
So that's quite a long little introduction around my name, but I thought that um, the themes attached to that link to the themes that we are going to be discussing this week and next week. Um, so without further ado, I would really love to just do a, a round of um, names from everybody, just telling me your fullest name. So your first name, your second name, if you have it, your last name, your clan name. So just telling me all of your names and we can do it popcorn style. Um, so tell me your fullest name and then your preferred name or what people call you. So like I said, Ndibudzanyi Mpepu Wama Singo, and you can call me Ndi, Ndi. Then we can just do popcorn style until everybody's gone. Just introducing yourself to me because I'm sure you all know each other by now. Hi, I'm Marli Ritter. I only have one name. Um, and my name doesn't mean anything as far as I know. It's just a mix between my mother and my father's name, you know, that typical Afrikaans, let's just take two and mush, mush them together and there you have a name. <laughs> um, my last name, Ritter, is German. My grandfather is from Germany, so um, Ritter means night. Yeah, that's me. Thank you so much. And for everyone else who's going to go, you don't necessarily need to tell me what your name means this week, because next week we're actually going to dive into that a lot more when we look at African cosmology and naming and names. But yeah, just, just let me know your, your fullest name just as an introduction and what I can call you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michaela Jones and everyone calls me Mick. Hi, Andy. My name is Ari Lazarus, and yeah, you just call me Ari. It's short enough. Thanks. Andy, my name is Matthew Vincent McLean, and you can just call me Matt. Hello, my name is Amy, or Amy Gray, and you can just call me Amy. Hi, I'm Belinda. I'm from the Marve, very African surname, but you can just call me Belinda. <laughs> My name's Annelise Zeidema, and yeah, also just have one name, you can just call me Annelise. Hi, I'm Lara, but Lara Irene Yost van Vala, but you can just call me Lara or La. Hi, my name is Sinead Ann Worthy, <laughs> but um, I sort of just let people decide <laughs> what they want to call me because uh, it's pronounced very differently by different people. So some people like take the beginning and call me she, and other people take the end and call me maid, but <laughs> that's about it. Okay, I suppose I should go. <laughs> Hi, I've been using my legal name um, just because it's more simple, but the truth is that um, very few people, uh, unless they're dealing with me in a business context, know me by the name Elaine. I was actually initiated as a healer um, probably about nine years ago. I've had four shamanic initiations in various traditions. Um, uh, three Amazonian traditions and um, one African tradition, namely Briti from Gabon, and also um, being given uh, the African Sangoma beads as a, as a gift. And I'm also a medicine woman and I've picked up the Mpepo in your name. <laughs> so I know the power of name and the power of a word, and it's a very powerful construct. And I have to tell you, it took a lot for me to take on my name. And when I did my whole identity, I, I, lost, I lost my identity. It, it's an initiation, um, the power of a word. And words are, are extremely powerful. And um, yeah, I just really want to compliment you on owning your name, because when you step into your name, you know, you step into your power. And um, 
you know, something that really sits with me in Western cultures, we've lost our, our rights of passage. And, you know, often uh, in times gone by, we would be given different names for, for different stages of our lives, um, you know, as we would initiate into different ages. And it saddens me, you know, that uh, we've lost that. <laughs> so thank you. I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Oh, and I didn't say what my name is, did I? <laughs> so my, my healer name, um, the, my first name was changed slightly to Lana, but my actual name is Ezrai. Ezrai means the one whom God helps. It also means death, which is quite a heavy name to carry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's me. Hi there. Uh, my name is Dee, Dee Robinson. Robinson is my married name. And I actually found your story very interesting, Dee, because, um, because I was christened Doreen, and I grew up hating the name. I absolutely loved it. It was so old-fashioned for me compared with the Susans and the Tracys and the Michelles and the Tanyas. And um, fortunately, my family always abbreviated it and called me D. So it was very easy as I became an adult to just drop the, the long name completely and just then stick to D. Um, so that is really uh, who I am. I'm just D now. Uh, and um, yeah, very similar to yours. I wish I had an N in front of mine. Hi, Andy. Um, I'm Ruan and uh, Ruan or Don, uh, but a lot of people just call me Ru as well. No. Is that everyone? Okay, seems like it. Um, Clara just joined though. Did Clara introduce herself? Or I'm assuming, did Clara? No? Hi, <laughs> I'm struggling a little with technology here. Um, my name is actually not Clara, it's Clara because I'm Danish. Um, and I, my name is Clara Dupro Wiltoft. So I have my own name, my mom's name, and my father's name, which is a very typical thing in Denmark. And then one of the reasons my name's my name is Clara is because my mom wanted it to be a name that you can write in old-fashioned connected lettering. And they wanted a name that you can say in more languages. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for introducing yourself with your fullest name um, and yeah, letting me know what I can call you. Hopefully, I do get everybody's names today, tomorrow, and next week. Um, let's see how that goes. Okay, so I just like a little bit of a check in in terms of diversity, equity, and belonging. Um, if anybody has experience with this topic, either maybe as part of their studies or just something that you have self-studied or applied in your life somehow. Um, yeah, anybody have any background around this topic or maybe other courses that you've taken? Just like to get a bit of a, of a feel of the room. I have a bit of a diversity management training uh, from my bachelor's in peace and conflict studies. Sorry, I can't hear. I don't know if it's my volume. I have a bit of diversity so well. management uh, training from my bachelor's degree in peace and conflict studies. Mm, okay, okay. Great. And so was that, is that something that you practiced or um, something that you, you're saying was part of your studies? Um, a bit of both, I guess. Um, mm. I've done quite a lot of workshops on kind of power and privilege or intercultural mm. diversity. Um, mm. But it's a combination of theoretical knowledge and self-study and just 
trying to do exercises that I tend to think work well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And please share your insights if you're willing as we go. And anybody else? Uh, yeah, I've been working in environmental activism, well, climate change. Um, I was one of the founding members of Extinction Rebellion in South Africa. And you cannot actually address climate issues unless you address issues of, of social justice. And um, yeah, I've been working um, to highlight <laughs> this is a really big problem. Um, and to try to create more inclusive spaces. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit of my background there. Thank you. Thank you. And then maybe one more person wants to share whether you do have a background or maybe don't have a background in these topics. Maybe you could explain what they mean. Sorry? Could you explain what they mean? I don't to know explain? Those three items. Okay. So not, terms, so not terms that you've um, sort of come across before or really investigated before? No, I don't think in the context that you, you're talking about them, not. Okay. Okay. What context do you think you have come across them in? Well, I think I mean diversity. I would take as meaning um, diversity within a community, perhaps diversity of of people, diversity socially, culturally, um, economically. Um, I'm just not sure how the whole thing connects. So I don't know if I really have experience in that or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. And yeah, and I think today and tomorrow we'll definitely be unpacking a lot more of what these mean. Um, and so, yeah, that will be just sort of a continuous process through today and then tomorrow when I see you as well. But thank you for sharing that and everybody else who just shared now. Um, I think today is part one of this diversity, equity and belonging in the yoga context. Um, and it's really just going to be foundational, right, on a theoretical point of view of what these terms mean. Um, and then tomorrow, with it being part two, we're going to take that theoretical basic aspect and we're going to see how we can uh, practically apply it in the uh, yoga context, right? So in terms of all of you being here, I suppose, doing a yoga teacher training, maybe some of you wanting to teach afterwards, maybe not, but really just looking as um, yoga teaching at a, as a fear, sphere of influence where you can apply these values and competencies of diversity, equity, and belonging, which we're going to unpack now, what all of that means. So I'll start with just basic uh, one-liner definition, right, um, of what at least I mean by these terms, just based on my own background. So diversity, like Dee mentioned, is really simply just the state of being composed of different groups, right, and that could really be any kind of group, right, the groups can be defined, like you said, in terms of um, economics, in terms of maybe geographical location, in terms of maybe learning ability, in terms of maybe people who like pizza, people who don't like pizza, right? So diversity of different kinds of groups, um, which would be defined by yeah, various characteristics or values or beliefs or physical traits, right? You can go on and on and on. Um, and then in terms of equity, and again, I'm not a slideshow fan, you will be getting notes after this, but if you want to take notes now, I would advise you to, um, but you will get a notes in a workbook straight after this um, lecture. Um, but yeah, I'm not really a slideshow, slideshow fan, so please do take notes as we go. I see there's something in the chat. I'm just going to take a look before I continue. Um, oh, okay. Not related. Okay, so 
that would be around um, the diversity. And I think when we're looking at it in the yoga context, particularly in my own experience, I think in Cape Town and being in different yoga spaces in Cape Town, I wouldn't say that I've always felt that I have seen diversity in this, these spaces. Um, and I'll, I'll say very specifically in terms of um, race, um, being a black woman, um, I'll say specifically in terms of the LGBTQIA plus community, I'll say specifically in terms of um, bodies and ability, right, seeing different kinds of bodies and different um differently abled people within the yoga community um, is not something that I've necessarily seen. And so, you know, it's, this is why that we, it is important that we're looking at this because um, the yoga community locally and internationally does face criticism that it's not necessarily as diverse and as representative as it needs to be. Um, and then when we move on to equity, that's really a lot more about, I suppose, the state of just being fair, of being just, of being equal. It's more structural, it's more systemic, it's more institutionalized. And it's about having, um, I suppose, an equal distribution of power, of obligations, of resources, of opportunities, of privilege in society, right? Which we don't necessarily see, particularly in South Africa, uh, being one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, and then we can also see this inequality represented in our yoga context as well, in terms of who has access, who doesn't have access, who has privilege, who doesn't have privilege. Um, and then in terms of belonging or inclusion, right, just the state of being included or including, the state of feeling a sense of belonging, the state of feeling that you have a voice that matters, which is heard, um, the state of feeling like you are able to fully participate in a particular group or in a particular context or setting. Um, and I, will, I would say that equity and belonging also go sort of hand in hand, because sometimes I think equity, uh, belonging and inclusion is kind of seen as um, a feeling or more of a relational aspect. But I think it goes beyond that and does go more into uh, the equity piece as well around power and opportunities and things like that, which would then go a long way in um, making people actually be included and actually belong. So that's just introductory in terms of those. And we're going to go through a couple of exercises now, as well as in the workbook, if you want to take it further, that fleshes all of those out. Um, but any comments so far, just on those basic um, definitions of those terms, anybody who understood any of those three in a different way or want to offer a perspective? So just on diversity, equity, and belonging or inclusion. And again, I know the, the thing says lecture, but I hope I'm not here just to talk at you <laughs> um, and that we can have a conversation. So please, you know, share your insights, your comments, your experiences, your definitions. Um, and yeah, let's let's hope we can make this as conversational as possible. I see a hand up, please go ahead. Two hands up. Just pop in and, Sorry. and, and <laughs> you go Mick. Um, I personally haven't studied in this area, um, but I have been exposed to um, a lot of the uh, unequity and non-inclusive parts of the, this country. Um, my future sister-in-law is dating a pers person of colour and my partner has an adopted brother and we've had very in-depth situations that in a way I can never understand, but have started learning so much about it through conversation with them and, and their own experiences. Thank you. I think we had the second hand up. You can go, Mali. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. I'm waiting for you. We're just too polite. You go, no, you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then okay. no one ever goes. <laughs> yes, and everybody's just sitting awkwardly in silence. <laughs> um so yeah my my experience I haven't officially studied anything um within these topics but a large part of what I do in my job is looking at inclusivity in technology so um looking at building digital products for anybody people like accessibility people with physical limitations either mentally um and then on the other side, the, um, the LBGQT, and I don't know what all the other ones are, but, you know, just looking at things like, for instance, gender, gender fluidity, saying, are you male or female, like on a, on a website when you sign up. So that's my extent of being very aware of always make sure there's an inclusivity part. Um, but yeah, I haven't studied anything, but it is quite interesting because when I started digging into that, I realized that nobody actually knew anything and there, there's a whole there's a whole set of rules and regulations around I mean in Europe um, you get fined if your if your digital products are not um, accessible or inclusive um, South Africa is I think far from there um, but yeah so so that's just my two cents to the conversation it's a very interesting and when you start digging into it it's 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 quite big there's a lot to learn mm -hmm. Thank you. And yeah, I think just reflecting on the first two people who have shared, I think with the first person, I really enjoyed what you shared around learning from other people's experiences and being open to listening um, and learning uh, perhaps from different experiences to yours and developing that sense of empathy, I suppose. And I think with what you've just shared around the tech space and what um, diversity and inclusion looks like there. I think that's very, very important and quite a prominent theme now, especially that um, we becoming more and more digital. So yeah, I think that's very valuable. Next person can pop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think one theme that kind of cuts across all of them is education, uh, both formal and non-formal, because it's so, mm in it's a it's such an influence on how we would structure a class what we consider a class or a course what kind of words we would use um yeah and also kind of ties into the socioeconomical aspect and i think it's quite interesting as well in thinking about how you can make people comfortable in a class thank you Yeah, and I think I, perhaps with even just how um, a couple of people have shared so far, I like that you've made this distinction between formal and informal, right? And people saying, well, I don't know if I have experience in this or if I do. Um, and so I think that distinction is really important and knowing that both are valuable um, and valid. Um, and I think what's always quite interesting for me, especially with this last point that you mentioned, is in teaching diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, also making sure that you, the way that you teach <laughs> is inclusive and takes account of diversity. And yeah, that's quite a challenging, um, I guess, continuous um, yeah, journey that you can be, be on. Any other comments? We can move on. Yeah, I was just thinking about a, a video that Catherine, I was watching one of Catherine's videos the other day. I'm afraid I don't remember which one it was. The video has kind of bogged me down a bit. But um, she she was looking at um, percentages and, and she um, had noted that a huge percentage of, of um, people that got yoga are white um between 40 and 50 years old or 40 plus um well off financially and um with, with with spare money with um money to kind of throw around at classes on and i've been feeling a little bit uncomfortable about that because i i think as white people sometimes we just don't think about this stuff you know you don't think i'd never thought about just about every yoga class I've been in has been a white class. So I just wanted to share that. 
No, thank you for that. And I think that that really, I'm glad that you did go through those statistics because I think that's hopefully then laid the foundation for why this lecture or why us having this discussion is important and relevant to the yoga context. So thank you so much for that. Um, I had thought we would do a practice at the top, but I think we're going to rather do it at the end um, because I think let's, let's, let's piggyback off of what you've just shared, Dee, which is that... Um, Maybe you hadn't thought about some of these things, right? Or developed an awareness around them. So let's start there. I'm on my phone. I should be on my laptop, um, but I was having tech difficulties uh, conveniently. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, can't screen share certain things with you for now. But like I said, you'll get a workbook. And luckily, I do have a printed out version um, of what it is that I'd like us to work with now. But does everybody have a pen and paper? You will need one for this next little exercise that we're doing. So we're going to start thinking about um, our own diversity, right? How it's shaped us, how it's impacted our life, the relationship we have with our own diversity. Okay, and so like we had said, when we look at or think about diversity, it's about different groups, right? And groups that can be differentiated, whether on a physical level, social level, mental characteristics, abilities, right? We can go on and on and on. Um, and today, I would like us to think about the groups that we form a part of that are relevant to social justice, right? So we can take a look at this little, I don't know if you can see this wheel here, Somebody just shout yes if you can. If you see this this, this wheel, um, and you can see around this wheel is different groups. So just take note of them. I'll read them out, and maybe you can create a little wheel for yourself on your piece of paper, right? So the different groups that I would like you to think about that you fall a part of: ethnicity, right, race, religious or spiritual affiliation, age, and then disability and breaking that down into physical disability, emotional disability, developmental disability, your first or your home language, your national origin, then we've just got four more here, sexual orientation, your biological sex, and your gender, gender identity. What was the first one? Ethnicity. And then socioeconomic status, had I mentioned that? Okay, and then you can create a little wheel for yourself. And I just need to grab a charger. So I'm coming back in a second.
Okay, so basically um, what I would just like for you to do is just to fill in under each of those, whether you're just doing it in a list version or whether you want to create a wheel like this, um, this sort of diversity wheel for yourself. And then you're going to um, write down which group you form a part of which is within each of these categories. Okay, and you can use your own sort of language to describe um, in a way that feels, yeah, most authentic to you. Um, so if anybody maybe just has any questions around being unsure what to put under any category. Um, so for gender, right, one could say um, woman or man or transgender or uh, non-binary or post-gender, right? Many different groups that you could form a part of. Right, for disability, one could say temporarily able-bodied or temporarily disabled or Name a cognitive disability or a physical one. Okay, so I'll just keep a couple of minutes here for everybody just to write down um, the different groups that they form a part of. And if there is a question at all or lack of clarity on any of the categories, just feel free to ask. Okay, has everybody had sort of time to fill out on each of those? I seem to have frozen. Am I back with you? <laughs> Okay. Okay, so just this just as an exercise to reflect on our own diversity. And again, I'd like us now just to open this up for some conversation. So there's a few questions that I'll ask and then anybody from the group can pop just to um, yeah, answer. So I suppose the first question would be which identity, right, or social group do you think about most often? So anybody can answer that question. Of the ones that you've now written down and identified for yourself, which one do you think about the most often?
Okay, please share with me via voice what is confusing for you. Sorry, I, was, I messaged because my dogs are barking. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really get it. Like, like my answers to this, what do I think about the most? So, for example, I would say currently um, I'm working in a school context doing diversity, equity, belonging work. Um, and a lot of what we were working with is race and racism um, and having to confront that quite a lot for myself. So the identity that I think about most often would be my black um, identity. Okay. Right. My black race. Okay. Does that make sense now? Yeah. So for you, which of these identities do you think about the most? Okay. Thank you. Do you have um, an answer that you'd like to share with us? Indeed, I'm happy to answer. Um, okay. So at the moment, I think it's because I'm going through a turning 30 phase that age is a big factor that I think about at the moment. And as you start to notice the, the loss of the youth and moving to changes in your body mentally. And as I also coach um, in martial arts, juniors, seniors, a whole range of students, trying to be aware of what I'm experiencing in that change and how to adapt it for the ages that I deal with. Um, and whether it means anything, to be honest with you, whether age actually means anything or if it's just a construct that we've invented. So. Thank you for that. I must say, I've been thinking about age a lot as well. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else can just pop? Which identity you think about most often? Um, I think from my side, it would be gender. Um, as a female, I work in a mainly um, male industry. And since I've been young, there was always this perception of um, you can't show any vulnerability because that's a weakness. So from a very young age, I've always had to be strong and I just had to get my shit together. And um, so I created this almost like an alter ego, um, which I've only realized the last year, year two years basically, that um, I need to be more in touch with my feminine side because it's not a weakness to be a female in a, in a male dominant industry. So yeah, that's for me, that is, that is the thing that I think about the most. Thank you. I see two more hands still. Okay. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think mine kind of cuts across some of these, um, but it's definitely my ethnicity uh, as I'm adopted because there are so many kind of clashes and assumptions and times that it's being brought up. And, and I think it kind of touches on some of the others because it was quite late in my life uh, that I, you know, kind of experienced being treated differently because of my color, um, because I was growing up in very kind of a very safe, uh, wealthy environment. Um, so, yeah, I would say like a cross section of those. Thank you. And when we go um, a little bit more to the theoretical part after this, I think what you're highlighting is the intersectionality of a lot of these groups um, and how they influence each other, interact with each other, and we'll definitely get into that. So thanks for bringing that up. And I think there's one more hand, yes. Sorry, the reason it took so long is because I need a lot of these on my mind. <laughs> um, but I do think that um, religious and spiritual affiliation is definitely still, because I don't know <laughs> where I stand. Um, in the beginning of my life, we were like very religious. And then I, I think it happened as we grew up, what also happened with my parents that we sort of just took a break and decided to like just be good people and I think I've like all my friends are still very associated to something and I I believe in something I just don't know what so that's my, <laughs> that's my big question 
Thank you. And then did I miss anybody who wanted to comment on this? I think that was the last hand, hey. Okay. Okay. Um, another question then on the flip side, maybe one or two people, which um, group do you think about the least? Which social identity do you think about the least? Um, yes. I guess we think that mine is national origin because I don't doubt my South African heritage and I never will. I don't really want to leave. <laughs> Thank you. And anyone else think about the least? Yes. Hi, yeah. Um, I actually think probably developmental disability and maybe even physical disability, probably because, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't know if I've ever or maybe met one or two people and have a very limited understanding of what a developmental disability is and physical disability. I have very little exposure to people with those disabilities. So I would imagine that, you know, just because of my context, it's something that isn't in my face. And so I don't think of it um, that much. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so I think maybe just a final question. We could ask so many questions here and this is just to help us explore diversity, what diversity means and what diversity means for ourselves. Um, which identity, and you can ask, answer either one of these. So which identity has had the greatest impact on you? Um, or which of your identities would you like to learn more about? So you can answer either one of those questions. So we can maybe take um, two or three people there. So which identity has the, had the strongest impact on you? or which identity would you like to learn more about? And I suppose with what was just shared now, maybe thinking about um, you know, disability the least, I don't know if that maybe um, is something you would like to then learn more, more about. Um, yeah. And it's quite difficult. And I, I suppose with somebody who brought in the intersectionality to kind of single out one. Um, but yeah, if anybody has anything to, to share on those uh, prompts. Yes. Um, I think, what was the question again? The most and? What? The one. Yeah, which identity has had the strongest impact on you or which identity would you like to learn more about? Okay, my strongest impact would be religious and spiritual. And then the one I'd like to learn more about is disability. Thank you. Um. One more person, or oh, I see two hands. I think. Yeah, I yeah? suppose the, the one that's had the, the greatest impact has been socioeconomic uh, status. Um, and then the one that is something that I, it's a continuous journey, is the spirituality, because I feel like as I get older, my belief system continuously changes and I keep asking different questions and growing through that. Thank you. Okay, 
So, yeah, so this is just around exploring diversity, which is obviously just the, you know, living in a society or hopefully building a yoga community um, that is composed of as many different groups as possible um, so that it can adequately represent the society that we live in. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of, it's very important for me to distinguish between diversity and then equity, which is what we'll be tapping into now. Because again, diversity is more just about having different groups of people and perhaps even um, celebrating those groups or perhaps even um, creating some inclusion or belonging um, for all of these groups. Um, but I think it's very, very important for us to differentiate between diversity work and equity work and the two different competencies that those require and that you can hopefully build as yoga teachers um, or even just yoga practitioners um, and people in general. So when it comes to equity, right, we look at these different groups that we form a part of um, and with each group, uh, it has a different status in society, right? Each group or, or rather each category has different groups underneath it. And each group has a different status in society, which would either be privileged and advantaged or targeted and disadvantaged. Or sometimes it's kind of like a border identity group where there's some aspects of privilege depending on context or perception and some aspects of disadvantage or being targeted depending on context and perception. So I'll get into that a little bit more now. And again, you can take some notes. Again, you will receive um, a summary of these. So to discuss equity, there's a little framework with nine points that I like to look at because I think it's quite simple. Um, and yeah, unfortunately I'm on my phone, I can't share screen, but I will just um, read and discuss with you, right? So the first point we've already done, right? So this, you can look, you can title this a sort of equity framework or social justice framework. Um, so the first point under this would be to define a social group, which we have already done. OK, so a group of people who share physical characteristics, mental characteristics, cultural characteristics, right, which we can classify into different categories. So we've done that. And that would be the first point of this framework. The second point of this framework, which we dove into a little bit, would be that social groups have different statuses in society. Right. So. No group is neutral. It has a certain meaning in society, right? You would have generally your advantaged group, which is also known as the agent group or the dominant group or the oppressor or the privileged group. Okay, so this is the group that has the access to opportunity, to power, to resources in society. Then you'll have your targeted group, also known as your subordinate group or your oppressed group or your disadvantaged group, okay, and is on the flip side of that coin, right? Doesn't have the access to the resources, doesn't have the access to the opportunities in society, hence this imbalance and this inequity in our society, which we also see trickle down into our yoga spaces. Um, and we'll be speaking about how, how this manifests in yoga more so tomorrow in part two. Today, we're just doing, a, like I said, a basic foundation of an introduction to these terms, just so we can all have shared language and shared terminology. Um, yeah, and just a shared understanding of what we're actually going to be diving into. Okay. Um, and of course, we understand, like I said, that it's not always so um, black and white, if I can say, in terms of just either being privileged or disadvantaged. You also then have your border identity groups, okay, which might flip into either one or the other. So, for example, let's say that I identify in terms of my sexual orientation as somebody who is bisexual, okay, and so let's say I, my, um, Let's say that my biological sex is um, female and my gender identity is um, that of being a woman and I, my sexual orientation is bisexual. Um, and currently I'm dating um, 
a cisgender man and so I'm in a heterosexual sort of relationship. Um, however, so we know that in society, the advantaged or the privileged group in terms of sexual orientation would be somebody who identifies as straight or somebody who's in a heterosexual relationship. However, we know that the LGBTQIA plus community would then be in the targeted or disadvantaged group in terms of sexual orientation. So I would be a little bit of a border identity, right? In the sense that if I'm in a heterosexual relationship, okay, people might perceive me as heterosexual, perceive me as straight, and I might then receive those privileges in society. However, my personal identity is actually that of being bisexual, which forms part of the LGBTQIA plus community, which is a targeted group. So does that make sense as an example of a border identity? Does anybody else have an example of what a border identity could be? Or if you think that you um, would identify with a border identity? So I'll count to five in my head. And then if there's no <laughs> example, I'll move on. Okay, another example might have to do with um, disability, right? For sometimes people could either be, um, let's say you could have a temporary disability. Okay, so some of these social groups actually change over time. And so in your lifetime, within the same group, you might oscillate between part, being part of the disadvantaged or the advantaged group. Okay, so that's the second point on this. The third point on this structure would be that um, we need to differentiate, which again, we did speak about between social diversity and social justice or equity, okay? So social diversity is about appreciating social differences within people, within different groups, okay? Without necessarily having an emphasis on power and power dynamics and the differentiated access that people have to resources, um, and, and, and access in, in, in uh, society. So that would be social diversity. And then when we're jumping more into equity or justice, okay, it's about making sure that each group, right, has an equitable or equal share in terms of the access that they have to the resources and the power in society. So making sure that we have that difference, okay, the fourth aspect would then be looking at oppression. So defining oppression and how oppression impacts different groups or how oppression leads to us either being part of the privileged or the advantaged group or the disadvantaged group. So I'm gonna look at this at three levels, right? So we have three levels of oppression. Different theoretical frameworks might have four or five or six. I find this to be quite an easy way to look at it and I'm going to share a reading with you. Um, which I think um, really looks at this in a great way. So the first level would be institutional or structural. The second level would be personally mediated. Okay, so I'll go through each of these, what these mean. And then the third level would be um, internalized. So I'm just seeing if I have, um, so I can't share it with you. Let me see if I've got a... Yeah, okay, so I've got this here. So it's a four page reading. I'm not going to read all of it in its entirety and you're welcome to read it when I send you the workbook um, in more detail. But basically um, there's a reading called Levels of Racism, okay? A theoretical framework on a gardener's tale. Um, however, these levels of racism, again, could be looked at as levels of oppression and can be applied to any other social group, whether we're looking at sex or gender or sexual orientation. Okay, so in this framework, you've got institutionalized racism, which is looked at at the differential access to goods, to services and opportunities of society purely dependent on the group that you form a part of. Okay, so institutionalized oppression is normative. It's sometimes legalized, right? As we've seen with apartheid in our own history, which was legislated. 
and often manifests in inherited disadvantage. So it's something that's intergenerational and has a historical base. Okay, it's structural and it's been codified in our different institutions, our customs, our practices, our laws. So different institutions being healthcare institution, being an education institution, an employment institution, a police institution. Okay, um, and we can not only look at it in terms of the differentiated access to goods, but we also look at it in terms of the material conditions that people actually live in. Okay, so this would be quality education, sound housing, gainful employment, appropriate medical facilities, a clean environment, access to sanitation, as well as sort of voting rights, governance rights, and whether you have a voice in society. So the institutional and the structural, I think what's quite important about it is that it exists even in the absence of people's thoughts and behaviors, right? Because often when people look at oppression or any kind of ism, which is sexism or racism, sometimes people kind of focus on their own individual thoughts or their own individual behaviors, right? Whereas actually it's not only just about the individual, it's more so about the, the society and the way that the society is structured. It's something that's codified and goes on regardless of our individual actions. So does anybody have any questions or comments on the institutional level? Everybody kind of understand that? And again, I understand that people have um, background in this. So this is really just foundational beginner level, just creating a shared language. I think there was a comment in here. Maybe also interesting to Google um, Johan Galtung's violence triangle as well. I haven't come across that before, actually. So please do share that. I'm going to take a note of that and take a look. Full um, article for those so kind of the full article on that is like an academic article i don't necessarily think that that is too helpful <laughs> um okay. to read alone standing um or alone um but otherwise it's kind of a it's like the triangle model and then on mm -hmm. the top you kind of have all the invisible stuff and then mm -hmm. oh no sorry on the bottom you have all the invisible stuff and on the top you have all the visible stuff and in the mm. bottom, you would have kind of symbolic structural violence. And then in the middle, mm. going up, you would kind of end up in the top with the physical violence, like stuff you can actually see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's actually so um, helpful and useful. I'll take a look at it and maybe reflect on it um, tomorrow when we see each other. But yeah, that the institutionalized or the structural, um, I think the language you're bringing there is quite important, is sometimes invisible. Um, but very, very um, impactful and influential. Um, okay, so that would be the first level that this model is looking at. The second level would be the personally mediated oppression, right? And so we can break this down into two parts. The first part being prejudice, the second part being discrimination, okay? So prejudice has to do with the assumptions that I have about other groups of people and the assumptions that I have about people's abilities, people's motives, people's intentions, okay, any negative stereotypes that I have. So this has to do with my thoughts and my feelings about other groups. And then the discrimination has to do with me acting based on these assumptions, treating people in a different way. Okay, so the, different, the, the discrimination has to do with um, action. And I think personally mediated is what people often think about when they think about oppression or racism or sexism. But again, there's this other world of it. But yes, so it is a part of it, but not all defining. And then I like the examples that are listed in this article here that I will share with you. It says that personally mediated racism can be intentional as well as unintentional, right? However, both are harmful, but can be conscious, unconscious, intentional, unintentional. 
and it includes acts of commission as well as acts of omission. So it's not only when we act that we could be harmful, but even if we are not acting, that could be what's harmful. Sorry, my daughter's in the background here, <laughs> making a few noises. Okay, and so it manifests either as a lack of respect, right? So perhaps as a black person, I could work, work, walk into a restaurant and receive either poor or no service, right? It could also manifest as a failure to communicate options to a particular group of people because of the negative assumptions or stereotypes that you hold about that group. It could manifest as suspicion, right? So maybe shopkeepers vigilance, right? Being vigilant of particular groups of people because of how you assume their motives and their intentions. Um, it could be everyday avoidance, such as clutching your bag when you're walking across a particular group of people when you wouldn't cl clutch your bag if you were walking across a different group of people. Um, it could be standing, right, when there are seats because you don't want to sit next to a particular group of people. It could manifest as devaluation, right? So maybe you're surprised as, at somebody's competence because of the group that they form part of, right? Being surprised that somebody can read or write or articulate in a particular way because you didn't expect it from that group of people. It could manifest as dehumanization. So the police brutality that was really, really loud last year with the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, so these are all ways that personally mediated oppression um, could, could um, sort of happen. And then the last level, at least in this um, framework is the internalized racism. Okay, and so this is defined as acceptance by members of disadvantaged groups of negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth. And so I shared this a little bit about my own name in the beginning, right? Feeling that my culture, my language was devalued and somewhat seen as inferior in the society and context that I grew up in. I then began to believe those messages and altered my own thoughts and behavior based on those messages. So you can internalize um, the societal inferiority about your own group and start to believe that and act upon that. Okay, and then on the flip side of that, you can also internalize the superiority and believe that you are better than other groups. Okay, and so perhaps around white supremacy and internalizing whiteness and acting within that way. And they give different examples here um, of how one could um, internalize um, uh, inferiority or oppression. Um, so it could be, so, so they, this is um, levels of racism. So the examples here are race related. So they say it could manifest as embracing whiteness. So using hair straighteners or bleaching the skin to become lighter. Um, it could be self-devaluation, right? So using, using racial slurs as nicknames for oneself or for others, okay? And having a malicious intent while doing that. Um, yeah, so these are sort of the three levels. Um, and before we move on, any questions? Is that clear to everybody? Anybody need an example on anything? Okay, so this is where we're digging into the justice or the equity aspect, where it's not just about appreciating different groups of people, but it's also about dismantling oppression at all three of these levels. Okay, would be what the equity work would actually be and what it would look like. Okay, the fifth aspect, right? So that was the fourth point, looking at the different levels of oppression and defining oppression in that way. The fifth level would then be defining privilege, right? which would be the unearned access to resources or social power, which is readily available to somebody purely because of the group that they form part of. Okay, so I don't know if you've come across the invisible nap stack. Okay, anybody come across that? Anybody maybe want to share the, um, any, is there anyone in the group that's come across that? Maybe I can go. Um, yeah. I guess when when you're from a developed country, there is like a form of 
privilege, and especially if maybe if you're from a country with a great welfare state like mine, um, there is a sense of like a a privilege as soon as you just go outside of your own border, because mm -hmm. there's there's so many things that you just get to to have as a form of security in terms of passports and educational support and all of these things that are just really working in, in a strong welfare state. But then at the same time, if you're not um, like me from a socioeconomically very well off family, then you do in certain levels don't necessarily enjoy the, like the highest level of those privileges. Um, so it's kind of like a double-sided uh, thing. Yeah. And thanks for that. One of the points here is going to look at, I suppose, how your different identities, when they come together, whether they buffer you against oppression or make you more vulnerable. And so I think that's kind of a double sided that you might be talking about as well. Um, I see a hand up. Sorry, Andy, will you please repeat what you asked us to, uh, I didn't hear. You said that I heard the end of it, knapsack, I think. Yes, the invisible knapsack. So you can actually take a look at this, um, particularly, and I'll send this maybe with along with the, with the workbook. So let me just create a note for myself to send that. Um, particularly if you are identifying as a white person, I think it's quite a good um, resource to take a look at, to just become more aware of the privilege, um, privileges associated with whiteness. And so have you come across that? Oh, no, resource no, before? no, but I was going to mention the white privilege and Clara mentioned her privilege, which is why I asked what it was about. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so some of the things that are listed on it, I'll read some of them, are feeling physically safe in most places in your everyday life, having connections through friends or family that facilitate reaching your career goals, having access to health care, having your family legally sanctioned and protected through marriage, sharing similar dominant cultural expectations with others in your school or workplace, being seen by others as an individual rather than a stereotyped as a member of a particular social group, right? And so for some of us, we might answer yes or no to each of those um, pointers, um, but I think it's a good um, resource to take a look at because most of these experiences, again, right, are unearned, right? It's something that you kind of have access to purely because of the group that you form a part of, okay? The sixth point here, we're almost coming to the end of this framework, would be that um, oppression is an overarching concept with many different manifestations. So what I found a lot of the time, if I'm working with certain people or doing any kind of consulting, people would ask around diversity, equity, and inclusion work, right? Will say they want me to come and work on this with them, but then you'll realize they're actually just wanting to work around race and racism. Right, so diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, oppression, privilege is not, um, doesn't manifest only in one way, right? So race or racism would be one manifestation, but like we said, when we look at this, this sort of wheel, there are so many different social identity groups and oppression, privilege, you know, equity, inequity can manifest within any one of these groups. Okay, so that's just the sixth point. The seventh point is that we are socialized into these systems, okay? So whether we like it or not, we are a part of this web and we either benefit, right? Or are unfortunately are disadvantaged by this web, okay? So you have a lot of people who will say, well, um, I don't see race, right? I don't see color. I don't um, act in this way. I don't act, uh, hold these assumptions, okay? And that might be true for that person, but the truth is that we live in a society where every single one of us is being socialized into this, whether we like it or not, okay? Um, and so I think there is a book here, since I'm not sharing my screen, which I think actually describes this nicely. Let me just see if I can find it. 
just okay so here i don't know if you can see that but it's just i'll read it out instead um so one of the key points that i hope um in kind of today and tomorrow that we can all maybe start to um look at is how can we take responsibility for ourselves and for the change needed in society. And I think for me, one of the points of taking that responsibility and actually becoming competent in diversity, equity and inclusion is being is realizing that we are socialized into this, right? That it is a cycle, that it is something that's happening. We can't opt out of it, right? We are all embroiled in this web. Okay, and so it's about becoming aware of our roles in the perpetuation of oppression, okay, taking personal, interpersonal and organizational stands in our lives, unlearning misinformation and learning correct information and consciously working towards change. So again, I think it's quite important that we learn about this in a yoga teacher training because becoming a yoga teacher is a sphere of influence right? You can look at it kind of like as an organizational part of your life and a sphere of influence that you need to take responsibility in to make sure that we're not perpetuating the same cycles. And so this little cycle of socialization, one is that we are born into a group membership within a dominant culture or in a, a disadvantaged culture, okay? So we are all born into particular groups, whether we like it or not. Okay, we are then taught interpretations of history. We are then taught explanations for injustice. We are normalized into the inequity that exists in our world to the point where maybe we might not have actually even thought about these things, right? For a lot of people, I think last year, they hadn't even thought about a lot of these things, right? Because that is the way that we are socialized. It's normalized for a lot of people. Then there's significant teachers, right? Whether that's parents, that's teachers, the communities that we form a part of, our religious authorities that consciously or unconsciously send us certain messages, okay? About particular groups, about the way of life, about certain privileges. And then this is reinforced and sanctioned by our culture, our traditions, our social institutions. I think somebody was, was sharing around gender and their experience of gender in terms of how social um, um, institutions maybe sent down messages about what it means to be a girl or what it means to be a woman, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, okay? Even education systems, healthcare systems, there's all underlying messages that we're socialized into. And then as a result of all of that, we will then act out in our prescribed roles of either internalized oppression or internalized privilege. Okay, and so maybe when you look at your wheel again as the different groups, you can start to see where have I potentially internalized privilege or internalized oppression within the different groups that make up who I am. And then the last part of the socialization cycle is that we maintain the status quo, right? Either by protecting, and justifying our privileges, okay, which I see happen a lot through inequities and unjust treatment, either that we experience or that we perpetuate, right? And we can even perpetuate by being silenced, right? If we're silent when we see things, when we don't stand up, we are part of the cycle. When we're just thankful for our privilege, right? And we don't question the norms and the structures that have facilitated it or see how we can redistribute the same privileges to other groups that don't get to enjoy them. Okay, and when we also then pass down these messages, harmful messages to our own children, to our friends, to the people in our workplaces. Okay, so we are socialized into the system of belief and we are all part of the web, whether we like it or not. And therefore we all need to be part of taking responsibility to break the cycle. Okay. 
Um, I see a few, I think people have been sharing some resources in the chat, which is really, really great. Um, Satya Truth. So tomorrow I'm going to be looking into um, the different ethical codes in the yoga philosophy and how that relates to diversity, equity and inclusion. So thank you for the person who's already brought that into our conversation. Maybe also helpful to Google privilege line questions. Yes, those are taken from the invisible nap stack most of the time to learn about different kinds of privilege. Um, E.g. this type of exercise has been very different for me in Denmark and in South Africa. Yeah, very, very useful. And I think, yeah, I think if people can, um, yeah, Google that or look at the invisible snap stack and just for yourself journal um, what comes up for you and what you maybe become aware of through taking yourself through that exercise. Maybe it would be cool to talk about responsibility versus or accountability. We, if we have time, we definitely have time tomorrow. Like I said, today is just an introduction on a theoretical level and then great video on systemic racism, quick explanation. Cool, thank you so much. I'm gonna take a look at that um, and everybody are yeah, just, just taking note of all the resources that everyone is sharing. Um, and then the eighth aspect here, we're almost done, is that oppression is based on negative stereotypes of targeted groups. Okay, so we already went through this when we we're looking at the three levels, right? Institutionalized, personally mediated, internalized. And in personally mediated, we looked there at prejudice which are the thoughts and the assumptions that we hold about other people, which we then use to justify unfair, inequitable, unjust treatment, which has happened historically and continues to happen in contemporary society. And then the final aspect here, um, sorry, not the final aspect, second final aspect. <laughs> so it's a 10 point uh, framework is that oppression can happen from different sort of dynamics, right? So most of the time, we look at um, oppression from a vertical line, right? So oppression from the uh, advantaged group towards the disadvantaged or targeted group, right? A vertical line, which is one aspect in which oppression can manifest. The other way that oppression can manifest is through um, a horizontal line, a horizontal dynamic, so within a group. Um, and so for myself, one of those aspects is within a racial group, you'll have something like colorism, which is something I grew up with quite a lot. So within my own group, you have people with different um, skin tones, right? The lighter the skin tone, the more privileged and advantaged you are seen and valued in society. And the darker the skin tone, the more devalued you are in society. And then within that group itself, having that horizontal line of oppression, people holding prejudices amongst people within their own group, um, et cetera. You could even have within, for example, um, the gender, male gender, you could have um, if, if, if other men or boys perhaps are more, um, emotionally attuned and sensitive and cry so on, you would have another male um, perhaps teasing or bullying, right? And of course, this still forms part of greater um, vertical oppressions, but just saying that it can also manifest on this level as much as then it can then manifest on an internal aspect where you then start to believe either around inferiority or superiority, which has been messaged to you. And then the last 10th and final point, again, if you didn't get all of this, I'm sending it straight away after the Zoom call of ours, is that um, there are complexities in multiple identities. Okay, so we already looked at how it's not only advantage, disadvantage, you also get the border identity. But I think it's also important that when we look at our intersectionality, simply just meaning all the different groups that we are part of and how they interact with each other and how this then impacts our lived experience. So let's say for an example, they give a great example here that you could have two people who both have a physical disability, right? 
But let's say that the one person who has a physical disability is also white, is also wealthy, right? Um, is also cisgender, heterosexual, right? Perhaps privileged in all these other groups, right? Albeit probably being disadvantaged or targeted within the group of disability versus if you had this uh, another person with the same disability, but perhaps they are a woman, they are black, they are of a lower socioeconomic status. Okay, so all of this then would create a different experience, perhaps in terms of how they could um, manage or cope with their disability. Okay, so does that complexity and intersectionality also make sense? Okay, so that's just around the basic um, theory that I think would be important in terms of the language that we need to know and the concepts and terms that we need to understand before we dive into how we can apply this as yoga teachers, which is part two tomorrow. Okay, so I think for today, yeah, that's really, really, we don't really have time for our practice. I see we're already at half past, so I'll see if I can squeeze it in when we start tomorrow. It was just going to be some simple movement and meditation, which was going to integrate these concepts, but we can definitely do that tomorrow because we're already at 3.30. Um, but yeah, so just today was an introduction to those three terms um, and an introduction to our names because I don't know you. Um, and hopefully, yeah, I'll know, I'll be able to know everybody's names by the end of this. Maybe just three minutes here. Any questions, any comments, any expectations for tomorrow? Maybe you have a specific thing you would like me to cover in terms of applying this to the yoga context. So this is your chance to let me know. So yeah, you can check out with a request, with a comment, with a question, or maybe just a feeling, how you're feeling um, after this hour and a half of going through this. Thank you, I wanna say. I just really love the idea of incorporating uh, teachings on this into the curriculum, uh, with, especially in combination with some of the other extra things we've done uh, that I don't know that I, I didn't necessarily think that we were going to touch on these topics and like long history of yoga and so on and so forth and philosophy of other yoga um, kind of style. So I think this component as well is just like a brilliant surprise and it's giving me so much to think about thank you for sharing that yeah because sometimes I've been on yoga teacher trainings where people are like why are we learning this I don't feel like it's relevant <laughs> so if there is anybody who feels that way <laughs> feel free to share that as well but hopefully you can feel more we'll definitely get more contextual tomorrow in terms of bringing in yoga philosophy and talking about what you can practically do as a yoga teacher just thought it was important to go through the basics before we dive into that. Any other comments, questions? I was going to say the same thing. Thank you. That was really awesome. And it went by so fast because it was so interesting and amazing. <laughs> I just focused really easily and sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I okay. ask something? Um, yes. <laughs> am I too late? I can wait for tomorrow. No, no, no you're not too late. Please go. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't. Um, so I have. I live in a small community, um, and um, I have a, a role in my community, and um, I can see exactly what you're talking about. It's very, very interesting to me, being in a position where I'm planning. Um, to start teaching yoga, will you go into tomorrow how to structure integration within a yoga class? I'm fearing uh, objections on both sides. You know, there is a sense in our so-called colored community that you don't belong in the white community. And I'm not 100% sure what the white perception might be, but I have a feeling it might not be as healthy as we'd like it to be. 
So would one look at mm. integrating one class or would one rather look at helping a com the so-called colored community by having a class in a separate, in their sort of community? Am I making sense? I will need you maybe to be more specific in what it is so so that I'm not making assumptions about what you mean. <laughs> Do you mind giving me more details? Okay. So are you saying there are two different classes that you teach that are made up of different demographics or? Does one look at the bigger picture and just hold an integrated class, a yoga class? Does one in order to enable and make more people feel comfortable separate the two groups of people in the community? Okay. So what are the two groups that you're what are the two groups you're referring so we to? We have a fairly wealthy white, predominantly white community in the village that I live in, a predominantly retired people. Um, with excess money, many of them foreigners. And then we have a so-called colored community, um, which is quite a big community. Um, a lot of unemployment, a lot of drug abuse, a lot of issues in that community. So if I wanted to empower that community by offering a yoga class in that community, would that then be a racist action to do it in that community? Is the idea rather to see the bigger picture and insist on integrating one class? Okay. I just want to make sure I note down your questions. And unfortunately, I'm not going to answer them today because they're quite long, but I think it would be nice to bring this into uh, tomorrow because we're talking more practical in this way. So if you could just repeat if you could just repeat your your questions for me so that i have them for tomorrow i see that you've got the two different groups. your first question is around you've got a circle of color group is that already practicing yoga no no, no. There's no yoga in that community. No. okay and so you are saying you might want to introduce yoga but you're not sure um if that's problematic or racist or okay so that's part one of your question and then the would, okay yeah i'm saying i'm, I'm saying I'm quite sure whether it would be racist to take a yoga class into that community live by excluding them almost from a white class I see what you are saying. I see what you are saying. Okay, I've noted down your question. I would have a lengthy answer, and because we at the end, um, I'm definitely bringing it and it links to what we'll be discussing tomorrow. So we'll definitely, hopefully, um, we can unpack that together tomorrow. Okay. Right, thank you. Okay. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to practice. So maybe just take a couple of breaths by yourself. I don't want to hog any more of your time. It was great to meet you all. Um, thank you so much for the input and the resources shared. And I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye.